Hi, um, I may as well um, uh, start this meeting. Does everybody hear me? Okay. Um, hi, um, I'm Nancy. Um, I am a stats consultant for um, Stats Central. Um, and, um, and before we start, uh, I would like to um, acknowledge uh, the traditional custodians of the, the UNSW campus, the um, medical people at Kensington, the Gadigal people at Paddington, the CBD campuses, and uh, the Nunawal people at the Canberra campus. Um, and, and, um, um, and now I would like to tell you a little bit about um, Stat Central. If you guys are not aware, we are um, a unit that is um, uh, tasked with helping researchers across the university with their research design and statistical issues. Um, if you are an HDR student or a, um, a researcher at UNSW, you can come to us for some free support and, and advice. We also provide um, some short course um, offerings and, and getting people um, comfortable with some software to help them analyze their data or um, uh, help them um, uh, select the best research design for their, their, um, their study. Um, we have a monthly seminar series, well, which this is one, where we um, address uh, very common statistical issues uh, that we tend to see in our consulting um, um, practice. Um, today, we have Xixin Liu. She is a biostatistician, does a lot of work with um, St. Vincent's Clinical School, um, and um, has a good um, um, background in biostatistics. Um, and she has noticed uh, recently there's been a lot of people coming to her um, with questions about um, uh, meta-analysis. So she thought she would do a, um, um, a talk on that. Um, and so um, uh, please welcome uh, Shishin um, and enjoy the talk. Hi, hello everyone. Thanks Nancy and uh, good afternoon. Thank you for coming to this meta talk. Um, so I'm gonna share my slide. So uh, like Nancy mentioned, uh, so the meta-analysis is a very useful research synthesis uh, approach. Um, and uh, in the last couple of decades, uh, the publication with meta-analysis has been growing. And also that's reflect in um, our cons uh, consultation uh, over the last few years. Um, so I hope this general guide could uh, do some help for your research. So now I will go into the full screen. Um, uh, we have, we will start with a quick overview of the uh, systematic review and meta-analysis, including like the steps uh, to go and uh, the guidelines to follow and also the software to use. And then we will focus on the meta-analysis techniques, including how we put the effect size and how we assess also uh, incorporate the heterogeneity and the impact of bias. Okay, so uh, this flow chart highlights the key steps we need uh, to carry out a systematic review and meta-analysis. And we can see the meta-analysis actually is at the quite uh, late uh, stage. So first of all, we need to define our research question clearly and um, specify the hypothesis and then uh, uh, develop a protocol. And also for good practice, we will register our study. And then we will need a comprehensive research search from various database. And uh, we will need uh, inclusion, exclusion criteria to select our study. And then we extract data from these studies. And next, that's the time we conduct our meta-analysis. And finally, we're gonna do the reporting and publish our uh, findings. There are a few guidelines to follow. Um, 
to the guidelines were developed actually to improve the uh, and the discipline the, the research in uh, meta analysis. Um, the Cochrane handbook, I would say, is the first place to go, uh, particularly for people who never done meta analysis before. Because it's not just a guideline, it's also a very good kind of training uh, source uh, with very comprehensive um, description about uh, meta analysis and the whole systematic review process. And the only thing is, it's developed in the context of clinical trial. Um, but there are a lot of good information can be generalized to other disciplines. And then the PRISMA, so the, the flow chart and the checklist in PRISMA is actually very essential to follow. And also actually PRISMA recently developed some special uh, guidelines for scoping reviews for protocols for diagnostic test accuracy extra. And uh, the third one is the MOOSE. The MOOSE is uh, uh, newly developed um, especially for uh, observational studies. And uh, like mentioned, so if we register our study, we can go to the PROS Pedro website. Softwares. Um, the top link uh, gives actually a good overview about around 13 softwares uh, for meta-analysis. Uh, for the Standard general software, um, I, I would say R and Stata uh, have good package of function for it. Uh, for R, there is a journal article reviewed around 60 um, R softwares. So some are general and some are quite specific uh, for certain uh, type of meta-analysis. Um, if you are looking for some specific um, package, that's a good article to go. I put the link here. Also, there is a very good online tutorial talking about how to do the meta analysis in R. Uh, for Stata, the meta and the meta n are quite useful. And for R, the meta 4 and the meta are the two key, uh, very comprehensive package uh, for the met developed for, uh, for meta analysis. So for the specialized softwares, uh, Revman is very friendly, uh, but uh, the function is relatively limited, particularly when it's come down to single uh, group uh, meta-analysis. And the CMA, uh, comprehensive meta-analysis, this software is very powerful. Uh, the only thing is you need to pay uh, for the lessons. There are also other software like OpenMEE, specially developed for ecology and evolution. Okay, so that's the quick overview. Now we will uh, direct our focus on the meta-analysis technique. So we start with uh, looking at uh, the data type uh, for, uh, and the effect size index for the meta-analysis. There are two most common data types, continuous and binary. Uh, for the uh, st uh, summary statistics, uh, for continuous, we all know it's mean and standard deviation. So uh, one is come to comparing two groups, then we will have the mean difference or standardized mean difference uh, as the uh, indice. For binary outcome, we will use pro proportion to summarize the data. And the white come down to comparative uh, summary, then we have risk ratio, odds ratio, and uh, risk difference. They all very common uh, effects at index for binary outcome. So less commonly, we also gonna, we would have time to event type of data, which involves censoring. And the harder the ratio is the index uh, for the comparative for purpose. There are also other outcomes like ordinal and counts. Um, and so they could be analyzed in a sort of different effect size index like incidence rate and ratio. For the ordinal, it could be proportional um, um, odds ratio. Uh, and there's another one. So before what we, when we talk about is about single group 
the single group uh, measurement can be the uh, effect measure. And uh, then more commonly, so when we compare two groups, so the effect index um, we talked about. And the third one is uh, we also sometimes can synthesize information around the uh, cor correlation coefficient that is measure the strength of the relationship between the two variables. So the two variables can be two continuous variables. It can be also one continuous variable and one uh, categorical or binary variable. Uh, so in actually in practice, uh, it's not a perfect word. A lot of studies, even though they are looking at the same outcome, but they report uh, in a different um, uh, summary statistics or different effect size measures. So for example, some study uh, will uh, report the mean and the deviation, but some study may report the medium and the range for the same outcome. So it's, uh, it would be good like we can include as many uh, valid studies as possible. So there are some um, online uh, co conversion uh, to help us like get a common outcome, like we can convert the median to mean, or even if the study reported um, in uh, mean difference or um, odds ratio or correlation, then we can convert it into a common effect size. And uh, in addition to the online calculators, we also, uh, there are our package called, uh, for example, compute.es that can help us do the conversion. Also, this uh, package can also help us convert some test statistics to the effect size. In this way, we actually enhanced us to include the studies into our meta-analysis. So now when we talked about what the effect size we're gonna use to prove, uh, to get the, the overall effect size across studies. And there's another very important piece of information we also need to collect, which is the variance of around the effect size estimate. Okay, so it's normally uh, represent as reported as then error. It could be reported as standard deviation or negative and interval. So again, there are ways we can uh, we possibly can convert into the standard error or the variance. And uh, why we need the variance? So that actually leads to another important piece of um, important concept, which is called the weighting. So how when we put the effect size across individual studies. So how much each individual study will contribute to the final pool, the single uh, effect summary. And that is uh, the, the weighting we're gonna assign to each study. So normally, uh, most commonly, the weighting will be based on what we call the inverse variance. So that's the variance from the, um, from the individual study of the effect size estimate. There are two major approach. One is the fixed effect model and the other is called the random effect model. So now let's uh, have a close look at the two uh, models. So for the fixed effect model, let, if we look at the, the equation here, so W it represents the weight. So WI for the I study, it is the inverse of the uh, way I, which is the actually the weighting study variance. So which means the fixed effect model, it assumes there's just the one true effect size, just one true effect size um, across all the studies. So the weighting only be based on the weighting study, uh, study variance, way I. Then for the random effect model, this assumes that there are different true effect size underlying different studies. So when we look at the equation, the WI then equal to one over WI plus tau square. So there are two components here. So the WI against the weighting study variance. 
But uh, then the random effect model also include the tall square, which is the between study variance into the weighting. So the weighting has two components, weighting study variance and between study variance. So when we talk about this between study variance, uh, we have that concept about that's called heterogeneity. You probably heard of it. So this is the between study variance is the measure of the heterogeneity. And the heterogeneity that we talked about that is the between study variance. So that is an important, <clears throat> very important concept in the meta-analysis. Um, there are three um, heterogeneity measures. Um, the traditional ones are called the Q statistics. And uh, then the tall square, that's what we see. And uh, there are quite a number of different estimators for this tall square, the between study variance. And the traditional one is the called uh, this ammonia lard uh, uh, estimator DL. But uh, it's get be criticized over these years, uh, particularly for small uh, size, small study, um, small number of studies. Um, so uh, the criticized by the potential buyers. So now the restricted maximum likelihood estimator is uh, more recommend as well as this um, uh, HKSJ. So that is a, a corrected. Uh, it, it, this estimator corrected for the standard error of the interval and the interval. And the I square statistics. So this <coughs> is actually <coughs> come from the Q statistics, but incorporate um, the, the degree of freedom, which is the number of study into account. So this is a percentage ranging from zero to 100. And it is a recommend uh, indicator uh, to assess heterogeneity. So one, it's over, we can see when it's over 75%, the which indicate that there is considerable heterogeneity uh, in your um, meta-analysis. So one, <coughs> we, we see the, <coughs> sorry, considerable heterogeneity, then we need to in interpret our um, pool defect size with this caution. The common question people may ask is, uh, so how I choose between the fixed effect and the random effect um, model? There's no definite answer for it. And there's actually a lot of debating around it. Um, but what can be um, sure is like, there is a common misconception uh, about um, because we ha I have a uh, large heterogeneity on the heterogeneity test is efficient. So then I need to use random effect model. So this lo logic is not there. Um, this is more about the belief. Uh, if we uh, believe there's just the one true uh, effect size, or we believe there are different effect size across different studies. So when we have a, a considerable or substantial large um, amount of heterogeneity, we need really need to invest, investigate about it. So we, uh, we can look at the extreme and influential cases and conduct some sensitivity analysis. And we can carry out the subgroup analysis or meta regression if we have those study level characteristic available. So that is when we do the data extraction, we would uh, pref prefer to have those study level char characteristics include in your data summary as much as possible. Okay, so now um, it's the time for some fun to look at some real data. So you probably know why we call it as the forest adventure because we're gonna end up with a forest plot. Well, um, as always, the uh, start point is always the data. <clears throat> so this data is collected from a number of clinical trials uh, looking at a vaccination program 
uh, to prevent the uh, tuberculosis. <clears throat> so we can see here, um, so the outcome is if the patient uh, had tuberculosis or not. So that's a binary outcome, yes or no. And we compare two groups, vaccination group and the control group. So we end up with a two by two table. Um, then with this two by two table, so the good thing is for this, uh, for this meta-analysis uh, data summary, we have sort of the raw data. And then we can derive the effect size index uh, we are interested. So for this one, say we are interested in the relative risk, or we call the risk ratio. So which is basically the proportion of the tuberculosis uh, in the vaccination group um, compared to the tuberculosis proportion in the control group. Then we got, uh, for example, the top, the first trial, we got the risk ratio 0.41. And then we uh, take the natural log of it, we get minus 0 0.89. And then with a certain uh, the formula, we got the variance around this <coughs> log uh, risk ratio, 0 0.33. So like we mentioned, so that is um, <coughs> the effect size index and the variance, two key pieces of information we need. So in practice, we normally don't need to calculate by hand ourselves, um, <clears throat> they are uh, either online or the software can do the job for us. For example, for the uh, metaphor package in R, we can use the scalc uh, function uh, to help us uh, calculate um, it. So end up with the yi and the vi in the column. Okay, so here now we are in the forest. Um, to produce the forest plot, um, uh, I use the R package uh, meta, and uh, the, but the, most of the software will can produce quite beautiful uh, forest plot. Um, but for the R package, I think uh, we can customize it as much as we can, so it's very flexible. Um, so comparing the two uh, package meta and the meta four, they are both very uh, comprehensive. The meta four is perhaps have more advanced functions and the meta sometimes is like a wrapper of the uh, meta four. Uh, so some features are more kind of maturely designed and developed a uh, little bit more user friendly. So for this fifth, uh, first plot, I used the uh, meta uh, package. Okay, so then we can customize what we're going to include uh, in the uh, left side of the forest and on the right side of the forest. But the key thing to look at is the visualization of the data in the middle. So the square is the uh, represents the effect measure for each individual study, and the line represents the 95% confidence interval. The size of the square uh, ref, uh, reflects the weighting. So here uh, I choose the random weighting. Here, if we choose the fixed effect model weighting, you will see uh, kind of more contrast about some very large square or some very small square uh, in this plot. So at the bottom of the plot is the diamond shape. That is the pooled estimate. So in this uh, plot, I purposely uh, include both the fixed and the random uh, effect model result to give us some feeling um, about the two models. So we can see with the fixed effect model, the diamond is um, uh, more to the ones, 0 0.72, and with a much narrower standard error uh, confidence interval. The random effect model will uh, have the uh, put estimate of 0 0.46 and with a wider uh, confidence interval. So when we look at the heterogeneity, the I square we talk about that's the indicator for heterogeneity is 92%. So it's quite a, a very, obviously very high heterogeneity involved in this, um, this uh, trials. 
and uh, uh, the p value here is uh, kind of should be come from the q statistic test and it's indicated significant hydrogenarity there so when we look at uh, the fixed and the random weighting we would say um the we can see um the fixed effect give a lot of the weight to um the large sample size trial it gives like over half 56.7 percent of the weighting well for the random uh, effect model the weighting is like more spread out and that's easy to understand because when we think about the equation we have the fixed effect model only involves the um the recent study variance okay so that's related to mainly to the sample size but for the random, it also involve another component that is the between study variance. Okay, so then that's kind of even out. So that is, uh, so we would also normally see a wider kind of interval for the pool estimate from the random effect model. Like we said, if possible, we need to investigate the, uh, the hydrogenarity and uh, the subgroup analysis is a, a, a good approach to for it. So for this data set, we, we have, uh, as example, we have one uh, study level characteristic that is the uh, allocation. So if the intervention is allocated randomly or systematically, so then uh, we look at the um, two groups uh, separately and reflect in this uh, forest plot. So we will see the, um, the random group uh, has the uh, uh, lower uh, risk ratio, uh, 0 0.38. So that is um, the, the risk of tuberculosis uh, is uh, lower in the uh, vaccination group, right? And uh, for the systematic, the, uh, the risk ratio is 0 0.65. They're both below one, so which indicates uh, some uh, the effectiveness of the program. Uh, but uh, the random group is even lower here. But when we look at the difference uh, with some test, it's not significant. And if we look at the plot, so we can see the diamond for the two uh, if, even they are diff even though they are different, there's quite uh, overlap um, in terms of the interval between them. And the, both of the group have quite, uh, have quite high um, uh, hydro uh, hydrogenarity in the I square. Uh, as mentioned, so the meta regression is also uh, uh, um, can be used to investigate the heterogeneity. And the, compared to the subgroup, the meta regression can accommodate more than one uh, factor uh, in the in the model, and also it can give up give us the magnitude of the difference between the two uh, groups. So um, again, so the uh, result is quite consistent with the subgroup, with this just the one single factor. And if when we look at I square is still very high and uh, the R square, uh, we can see the zero percent. So that is not uncommon. So which means uh, normally if we see a very minimum R square, you would uh, not expect to see a significant difference between the two subgroups or a significant factor uh, in the regression, uh, which means this factor perhaps not help e explain the heterogeneity uh, too much. So there are perhaps other potential underlying factors dri driving this heterogeneity. So what now we uh, have looked at the put effect estimate and heterogeneity. Then uh, we need to think about uh, if there uh, is uh, bias exist uh, for the put as effect estimate uh, comparing to the genuine true effect 
uh, effect emission. And there are potential source of the, uh, the bias. And the one uh, quite common one is called a small study effect, uh, which means the, uh, so the small studies um, would believe like they, they are published only those uh, has large effects, significant effect found will be published. And uh, if those not significant, they probably just uh, um, keep to themselves or can't be published. Okay, so then the question for us is to how do we know if there's an evidence of any bears and how we access the, the impact of the bears. Um, so the, there's a very good plot to help us visualize the bears, which is the funnel plot. Funnel plot. Okay, so if we, uh, the funnel plot, the uh, y axis uh, norm is re reflects the precision of the study. Uh, normally it's a standard error, but it could, it could be also sample size for some cases. And the, the x axis is normally the, uh, the uh, effect measure. And the vertical line in the middle represents the pooled estimate and with the, the dash line to make the uh, pyramid shape is the 95% um, the, the confidence interval around the put estimate at each level of the standard error, okay? So when we look at the left side of the, um, of the, the, the left uh, graph, uh, that represents a quite sim ideal symmetrical uh, funnel plot we can see each dot is represents the, the study. And they are quite evenly spread out around the vertical line, the pool estimate, uh, along the different levels of the precision. However, if we look at the right side of the plot, that's a presentation of the asymmetrical um, uh, from the plot. Um, there are quite a number of studies at the uh, right corner uh, so which means they are uh, have larger standard error and uh, they tend to have larger um, hood effect uh, effect size so that indicate sort of um, potential uh, work concern about the buyers Uh, in addition to the virtual uh, inspection, uh, we can also, there are also some tests available to test the asymmetry. Uh, there are kind of like some of you, um, it would be at least 10 studies, uh, then the test of the asymmetry will be uh, relatively more reliable and, um, um, and, and stable. Um, there are quite a few tests, uh, the rank based tests, Beggar's test and some regression tests. So the most uh, uh, widely used one is the Eagers test, also called the linear regression test. And here I want to uh, put a note on the Peters test. Um, so for the the Peters test is more appropriate uh, in most of the cases than the linear regression. Once come to um, the meta analysis on the simple single proportion. Um, the Peters test is sample size based rather than error based because when, when you think about the, about the proportion, when you get the standard error, the standard error actually is related to the proportion. So the standard error, if you use the standard error as the, um, uh, in, in the test, it won't truly reflect um, the, the, um, the, 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 the precision of the study. Okay, so then uh, again, when we apply the test to uh, our tuberculosis uh, example, we, uh, we get the final plot uh, at the bottom. Uh, it looks roughly um, uh, symmetric, even though there probably uh, we see um, a bit high, uh, one is uh, the high precision, um, there it could be a study more close to the one, uh, risk ratio close to one. 
And when we have a linear regression uh, test or Eagers test, uh, we have the test is insignificant. So uh, if, say, uh, we uh, notice that there are potential buyers and how we are, uh, assess the impact, like mentioned, so we can have some sensitivity analysis. So one of them is called the trim and the fill. Um, so uh, it's um, I, the, um, this approach identify and uh, some uh, potential uh, buyers uh, studies, they think that the studies may bring potential buyers and they kind of mirror it to the opposite side. So you can see at the bottom, they kind of like artificially fill some studies uh, over here. And then you can, then the um, put effect size uh, will be much uh, close to, to one. It can become 0 0.87. And um, so that's sort of a sensitivity analysis um, to give us some feeling about the impact, potential impact of the buyers. Some other approach uh, like um, uh, cumulative meta-analysis, which is uh, you start with just the one and I keep adding on one by one of the studies to look at the uh, put estimate, how the put estimate change. And, and the other one called the leave one out, that's uh, the other way around. You start with the whole um, data set, the uh, whole um, studies. And then each time you leave one study out, then look at how the uh, risk ratio, your pool estimates change. Uh, okay, so now we have uh, touched the uh, put effect size heterogeneity and the impact of the uh, impact of the bias. So that is the various uh, kind of standard meta analysis. There are quite uh, uh, a lot of research around the meta analysis, and there's a lot of extensions. So, for example, they are uh, so uh, generalized using the generalized linear mix model to uh, conduct the meta analysis because no, now the standard way to carry out the meta analysis is based on the no, no, normal distribution assumption. And also, uh, there are scenarios where, um, so for each study, there are multiple groups. And uh, the interest is the combine each individual group rather than comparison. So then that introduced the dependence uh, between those effect size in the single cluster. So there are multi-level uh, modeling technique uh, for, those type, for this type of meta-analysis. Also one way um, compare more than two groups, there are three groups and the direct comparison or indirect comparison that then involves the called network meta-analysis. And also the diagnostic test accuracy. So the meta-analysis on this field is special because it's involved in by right and binomial. Um, that's also, uh, there are specific technique uh, for it. Uh, also there are um, one, the individual level for each study, the data is available. So their um, uh, meta-analysis called the individual patient meta-analysis. Instead of the study level, it can go down to the individual level and it synthesize all the, the individual level, that level from all the studies. And also there are uh, structural equation-based meta-analysis. Um, so that's uh, pretty much what uh, the general guideline we talk about today. And there are some useful resources uh, if you um, want to study your, your meta-analysis. Uh, for the systematic review, I recommend working with a librarian in the library. Is, uh, it will be helpful. And uh, there are also an online uh, course you can watch free on the YouTube. And uh, like I mentioned, if you are R user, then this tutorial about uh, doing meta analysis in R will be very helpful. There are also some library links and um, uh, giving some useful information.
So, um, and also I put some uh, R codes uh, I used to, to uh, get the plots or the analysis. Um, um, I put in the appendix and some of the codes uh, and below the, the, the uh, in the slides. And here is uh, like uh, um, um, level for evidence. So you can see the, the top one um, level of evidence actually is the systematic review and the meta analysis of the uh, randomized control trials. So, so it could be the meta analysis could be um, if uh, if done properly could be have the actually at the top uh, tier of this evidence level. Okay. okay. Um, thank you very much, uh, Shishin. Um, if any of you have any questions, we're are happy to, to answer them. I think with this many people, it's probably best if you type them into the, the chat um, so we don't have too many people um, talking over each other. Hi. Uh Hi, it's Michael Pisa here. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Um, you know how you, you got the level of evidence that you were uh, just on the last slide? Is it practical at all to um, to give a weight to the studies by that, by that level of evidence at all? Um, sorry, is, uh, you said give a... To, um, to add a weight to the studies in the meta-analysis uh, in the um, to account for the different levels of evidence that you've got on the last slide. So you weight the studies by you give them some kind of coefficient by the level of evidence. Is that is that a practical approach or that so that um, the studies that are higher level are given greater weight in your analysis? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so the, the, the last slide I gave, perhaps they are different things, but uh, that's an a interesting thought. Um, so normally the, the weight is, uh, um, so it's not, uh, it's based on the, the variance, the precision, instead of the study design. So the study design, um, so far, yeah, it's not uh, uh, incorporated into the weights. Um, is, Shishan, is it true that um, when you are um, reviewing the articles and, and the studies that you'll be including in the meta-analysis, you often go through sort of a, a quality rating um, uh, process anyway? Uh, yes, yeah. That, that's right, Nancy. So, um, and also, uh, normally, if we uh, conduct uh, the, the meta analysis, it's kind of like the same study type. Uh, it's either all the observational study or it's either all the clinical trial uh, we will synthesize together. Um, and uh, so, then uh, also, we will uh, include study with uh, the um, the, the quality or um, in, uh, with certain inclusion criteria. Right. Okay, um, a, a few questions in chat. Um, Patrick is wondering, is heterogeneity good or bad? Um, yes, that's a good question. So uh, the heterogeneity is there. Um, if you uh, don't see heterogeneity uh, or very low heterogeneity, uh, which means uh, you're, you're more likely uh, your your uh, the studies you, you included are more homogeneous and you um, your put estimate reflects the one true uh, effect size. But if you observe heterogeneity, which means the studies you include, um, they they could potentially actually uh, represent different uh, uh, poten uh, sub population. Uh, so that gave you some more kind of thought, uh, uh, source to uh, worse to investigate why and may make your study more interesting, but I won't say it's bad. It's just like uh, it's a fact. Um, here's uh, from Xiaolong. 
Um, uh, do we only mention symmetrical and asymmetrical funny funnel plots in the in the manuscript? Can we do a test for asymmetry uh, in, of the meta analysis, including fewer than ten studies? So I guess a little bit more on the funnel plots and how to use them. Right. So yeah. So the funnel plot, the visual uh, inspection, and the test should be um, should be. Um, Kind of inter interpreted jointly. The test is not uh, like um, a super kind of uh, um, reliable. Or if you use different tests, you might got quite different result. So that will be, um, um, uh, but that will kind of uh, bring to your attention uh, to 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 assess the impact of the bias, like use the trail uh, trim and field plot or the cumulative. Um, meta-analysis to identify if there's any potential um, study that, that's uh, leading to the potential bias you observe. And uh, there's not like right or, the white or black, or this, my study is, uh, uh, the meta is asymmetric or symmetric. Uh, I guess it's more, more um, you can put in a discussion um, and Vinod asks, uh, oh, this is a very interesting question. Can you explain a bit, um, oh, um, oh, wait, which one? Uh, there it is, the reliability of a measure. Um, would you advise not including data that or studies that um, um, is not measured by reliable measures or how do you include that type of information in the meta-analysis? Mm. So uh, I I would say in general that's fell into the category about um, the quality of of the of the data or the quality of the study. So if um, uh, you have study or come from reliable measure, but this study particular study uh, it, it just come from not very reliable measurement, um, it. Um, you will think about uh, if you include or not, or at least do some sensitivity uh, to see the put estimate, how the put estimate uh, varies with or without this study. Um, and Bernard wants to know, um, uh, can you explain a bit more about the appraisal tools for meta-analysis review? Um, so that's probably not uh, my specialty. Um, the systematic review part, the press or two, um, would be, um, I think, um, uh, you probably talk to a librarian or um, would, be, uh, would be helpful. Um, Patrick wants to say, can you give an example of what you mean by one true fixed effect model versus different true effects, random effects models? Okay, so, um, that's say uh, I showed we did a, a, a subgroup analysis. And so if say the random group and the, the systematic group, um, they are, so the random group actually um, um, say didn't have much effect. So it's just like uh, um, the risk ratio is still around one. And the systematic group has really generally like a great effect. So they say uh, the risk, risk ratio is 0 0.2. And they are, um, so they are actually two subpopulations. And if that exists, um, you will consider, um, you, uh, it's probably not make too much sense to combine these two together. You rather actually report them separately. Uh, but for the one true effect size is um, there's just one uh, overall population and there's just uh, the, the one if, uh, true effect size there. There's no subpopulation represents like say some people benefit more from this intervention, some people benefit less, but, uh, but uh, this, this is, should be just universal. Um, and one last question from chat, and then we've got, looks like we have one person with their hand, hand up. Maybe we'll do the person with the hand up first. Um, yeah. Go ahead, Li Wen. Yeah, um, sorry, I have a question about the, I mean, the, um, when I run the regression, I, um, I use both, I mean, fixed effect and 
random fixed effect um, and random mm -hmm. effect. But yeah. um, if I remove this effect, the uh, results will change a lot. I, I, mean, I mean, the significant results become insignificant. Um, and I, I mean, I don't know how to explain this. I mean, um, could, so do you have I, any? Um, you, you, did, I mean, uh, you did both fixed and yeah. random. Yeah, uh, so I, I mean, if I remove these effects, the results will change a lot. So I'm not quite sure how to explain this, I mean, scenario. But, um, um, so why you say you remove, uh, what, what did you remove? Um, fix effect. Fix. So you, you, you use, when you use random effect, uh, you found yeah. it's not significant. But if you use the fixed effect, you found it's significant. Is that, is that what you, you, uh, what you lost? Uh, sorry, um, I just mean if I remove all this effect, um, the results will change a lot. You, um, you remove study. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, if I use fixed effect, the result is significant, but I remove fixed effect, the result is, uh, I mean, non significant. Um, so did, did you, uh, what, when you say you remove fixed effect, so they are two approach, fixed effect or random effect. Yeah, yeah. Um, so do you mean when you use random effect, it becomes insignificant, is that what you observe? I guess that's what you observe, right? Uh, so like I mentioned, so normally the fixed effect um, can have smaller standard uh, uh, variance. Um, a narrow confidence interval, but fixed effect is random effect going to have larger um, conf confidence interval, uh, wider confidence interval. So it could be then, but how about your point estimate? How about your, your effect size estimate? Are they different or they are very similar? I think um, they are different. They are different as well. It could be ha having to do with how the weightings change. Yeah, it, sh it should be. Mm -hmm. uh, so how about, uh, but um, yeah, like I said, the, the choice between the fix and the, the, the random um, is uh, more about your assumption about if you believe there's just the one true effect or there are different true effects across different studies. And uh, also um, we need to look at, want to look at the hydrogenarity. So you probably can send me your, um, your output uh, in email, then we can have a closer look. Okay. Thank um, you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank um, you. Last, um, last question from chat. In subgroup analysis, um, can we identify whether the difference in effect size between two groups is statistically significant or not by looking at the overlap in the confidence interval? Um, so I think that's a general question. Uh, by looking at the confidence interval, the overlap, uh, it gives some indication. Uh, if they are overlap, definitely um, uh, not that, not always mean they are, if you do the test, they are not, they are not significant. Uh, so like I already demonstrated, we, we do have those tests to help us. Uh, if we do, you do want to give some interpretation about the difference between the two subgroups, um, probably rely on the, the test result um, instead of the confidence or overlap. That's a kind of like a visualization. Okay. Um, oh, there's one one la quick last question, and I think we'll, we'll have to be done. Um, would you advise correcting the unreliability of measures before including them in the meta analysis? I saw some meta analysis that did this, where some did not. Um. So yeah. So the um the 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 reliability um. Yeah, I think it would be good practice to um, to assess the reliability. 
um, as part of the study quality. Um, okay, um, um, I think that's all the, um, the questions that we have. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and our next seminar will be at the end of April, April 29th. Um, and one of our consultants, Eve Slavich, will be presenting, although we don't have a title yet. So um, keep your eyes open and we hope to see you there. Thank you. Thank you.